Hello, kindred spirits, and welcome to Modcast, the podcast of the L.M. Montgomery Institute, broadcasting from the beautiful campus of the University of Prince Edward Island. We're so glad that you've tuned in. This is Modcast Season 1, Episode 3, and I'm your host, Dr. Brenton Dickinson. In our quest to discover cutting-edge scholarship about the life and works of Lucy Ma Montgomery and join imaginative readers throughout the world, we welcome to the microphone our special guest, Dr. Kate Scarth. Kate Scarth is the chair of Ella Montgomery Studies at UPEI, where she works closely with the Ella Montgomery Institute and is also an assistant professor of applied communication, leadership, and culture. She's particularly interested in the relationship between story and place and works on writers from Jane Austen to Montgomery. Her current projects include yourlmmontgomerystory.com, which was featured in June 2020 on CBC. As always, you can check out our show links to this great project in the show notes. Kate, welcome to the Modcast. Well, thanks so much for having me, Brenton. It's great Mm. to be here. Good stuff. Now, Modcast listeners are avid readers, and so we like Mm -hmm. to talk about the books that are on our bedside tables. And I've just begun reading again Anne's House of Dreams, uh, Mm -hmm. one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm reading it with pencil in hand, so this is a very detailed or paying attention read. What are you reading these days, Kate? So I'm reading Helen Creighton's Blue Nose Ghost. Oh. Um, and so for people who don't know, Helen Creighton was an important Nova Scotian folklorist in the 20th century, and she mostly collected songs and ballads of rural Nova Scotia, but she also had a real interest in the supernatural. And I know everything doesn't need to connect back to Montgomery, but of course, a lot of these stories are drawing on a Scottish or even more broadly Celtic tradition. So it's kind of interesting in terms of thinking about the supernatural that appears in Montgomery's works. Wow, that's super cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And 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 I, I know that uh, you're an expert in romantic literature as a whole, and Montgomery was very much influenced by that whole world. But I, how did you actually tumble into Montgomery's stories for the first time? Mm-hmm. Well, certainly um, Montgomery and Anne go way back before I had any idea what romantic literature romanticism was. Montgomery definitely came first. And um, I'm getting really well rehearsed at telling my Montgomery origin story. So I don't actually remember a time when I didn't know who Montgomery and Anne were. But certainly I remember coming to PEI and to Green Gables and to Montgomery sites for the first time when I was eight. So my family came on a uh, summer vacation to PEI and I brought my stack of, uh, of Anne books with me and they're looking pretty rough around the edges now. And I remember reading them in our motel and I was just so excited to be there. And the Haunted Wood in particular um, just really stood out for me. And my parents still laugh about how I was the excited little tour guide, you know, telling them like, this is where Anne imagined the child ghost. And, you know, this is where she was, this happened. And um, so it was very special to me to, yeah, to be in those places where I met, I could imagine Anne being. <laughs> well, that's great. Actually, place is so important for your work. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it goes way back then. And one thing I wanted to say in terms of you mentioned romantic literature is that my PhD thesis was on romantic periods, so turn of the 19th century literature. And I was interested in suburban and urban spaces. And I ended up doing my first ever conference paper on Montgomery and suburban space in Anne of the Island. So there is a connection there. Um, romanticism helped me become a Montgomery scholar, even though I was, you know, already a a reader and a fan before that. What would you, like, I know she's writing during what we now call the modernist period, but wouldn't you, would you, like, how would you classify Montgomery as uh, an author? Wouldn't romantic be a pretty good category of thought? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, she's heavily influenced by romanticism and romantic ideals more broadly, as Betsy Epperly and others have shown. Mm -hmm. Um, And certainly, you know, there are important connections between the romantic writers like William Wordsworth, who Montgomery loved, and her own writing. So, for example, the romantic uh, child of nature, for instance, and, you know, kind of the adulation of nature, nature's a source of inspiration, are certainly um, features of her work that really resonate with romanticism. So I think, yeah, romanticism certainly fits her work. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of one of the great challenges of, of mm -hmm. thinking about her and her period where she is in it, but sits beside it in some mm -hmm. way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You and I have talked about Jane Austen, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you're a bit of an Austen reader. Is that fair to say? Yes, absolutely. And Jane Austen was in my PhD thesis. And I'm currently writing an essay on Jane Austen's Mansfield Park and Emily of New Moon and looking at the connections between the two of them as these kind of unwanted children who end up in these homes that are hostile to them in various ways and how they navigate that. So that's been a lot of fun, like bringing my two favorite writers together. There's nothing better than that. I'm also um, planning to write a piece on a romantic radical writer, John on Bellwall in Montgomery. So I think that that's kind of interesting for showing how she might connect with a very, well, a quite different form of romanticism. Um, one that is more overtly political than say a lot of Wordsworth's writing or other, you know, other of the big six um, romantic poets. Uh, but Bellwall and Wordsworth were friends and did share ideas in common. So, um, but anyway, that's, there's certainly, I think, lots more to think about in terms of Montgomery's connection to romanticism. But also I think too, you know, how she does connect with modernism, the convergence and divergence is there. Are, there's still a lot to be said there as well. Yeah, no, I think I think I think absolutely. I, I I don't know that anyone can escape a period, and I'm always intrigued by mm -hmm. what we get. You talk about the big six romantics, but I mean, we're talking hundreds of authors that are writing books that people loved at that time. Mm -hmm. They just don't yeah, all right. filter back to us today. And this is part of what yeah. I think the institute does: is Montgomery has remained this great figure, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the institute mm -hmm. helps recover it. But would you introduce our listeners uh, to um, basically, what what's the Ellen Montgomery Institute, and a little bit about your role? Can you can you talk first about the institute, and then about what you do there? Okay, uh, so the Ellen Montgomery Institute is situated at the University of Prince Edward Island, and it goes back to 1993, or that's when it was launched. Obviously, a lot of work was happening before then. It was launched by Dr. Elizabeth Apperly, who was an English professor at UPEI former president um, and also a really renowned Montgomery scholar. So the, the institutes launched in 1993 and then they had their first symposium in 1994 and that's has now become the biennial conference. Um, so it all started then. Um, the Institute involves really a lot of different people. There's a steering committee. Now there's a journal editorial board. There's a visiting scholar every two years. So uh, a lot of, there are, although the physical space is not large, it's large in terms of, of people who are committed to the Institute and furthering its mission, which is really all about two things. So the first is research about Montgomery, so promoting research, but also celebrating her life, her work, and her legacy. And we really focus on informed celebrations, so that's where the research and the celebration really come together. So making sure that information that's well-researched, that's nuanced, is getting out into the world about Montgomery. And that's especially important because, uh, you know, Anne has been so commodified, for example. Um, but certainly the Institute's very interested in supporting, in supporting tourism um, on the island and also global stakeholders as well but the yeah, so the research and the informed celebration are really what the institute is all about wow yeah that sounds that sounds fantastic well i mean what do you do what is a chair of that great enterprise mm -hmm. do Mm -hmm. So I am the first academic that's been formally tied to the Institute. And a lot of the time when we talk about a chair in academia, it's a research chair. So someone who's expected to do research on a particular topic. So Montgomery studies in this instance. And that's certainly part of my role, but it's also a chair in public engagement. And that's really where we come back to the informed celebration bit. My job is to make links with the PEI community. So all kinds of people. EI stakeholders in heritage and tourism who are interested in Montgomery. And then also my role is to connect with uh, global fans and readers. So really it's about making sure that research is happening around Montgomery and that it's being shared with people and that the Institute is, you know, within that mandate, supporting the needs of people in the Montgomery industry whatever form that might take. Right. Yeah. I don't want to spend too much time in the past. Mm -hmm. 
um, I actually want to be kind of more kind of forward looking about some of the projects of the Montgomery okay. Institute. But what's what's uh, something that's been really kind of cool about about the job about uh, you know working with the institute and being the chair and that kind of front communication person? Yeah, well, certainly a huge project that I've been working on is the Journal of Ellen Montgomery Studies. Mm. Uh, so it's an online journal, and it's been really exciting. There's never been an, a journal dedicated to Montgomery. Um, I love so many of the things that it does. We're promoting research. We publish peer-reviewed scholarly articles, very traditional research. But because it's a website, there's room for multimedia. There's room for non-peer-reviewed reflections. So it's it's really, uh, it supports all kinds of contributions to Montgomery studies. I've also been working on a online open access course, which will be launched in the next few months. So that's kind of looking towards the the future. And I think that that's really important. UPEI does offer a Montgomery course every two years. Uh, But as far as I know, the, you know, Anna Green Gables even has never been part of uh, the curriculum in the Canadian education system. Well, that's that's great. Actually, that's all really cool. But I've heard a rumor that the chair, you are friends with a Japanese princess. Is that is that how that goes? (laughs) We definitely have met. Uh, Yeah. So that was a pretty amazing um, experience. I got to MC a ceremony at UPEI involving Her Imperial Highness Princess Takamoto of Japan, who is the honorary patron of the Ellen Montgomery Institute. Um, And of course, that just speaks to the strong links between PEI and Japan because of Montgomery and uh, the the, the, Her Imperial Highness is very supportive of the Institute and of Montgomery. And while she was here um, on PEI, she participated in a whole range of activities, including the opening of the new Montgomery Heritage Park in Cavendish and the new Interpretive Center at Green Gables Heritage Place. It's kind of fairytale like, isn't it? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, pretty amazing to uh, to meet a, a real life uh, princess. That certainly doesn't happen um, every day. Yeah, you never know where Montgomery is going to take you. That's for sure. Nice. Yeah. Could you highlight maybe one or two things that you have ongoing or coming up uh, with the Montgomery Institute that, that our listeners would love to hear? Well, one thing I've been really delighted with is the uh, map of Ella Montgomery's Prince Edward Island that one of our student assistants, Heidi Herring, has developed. And it's great because Heidi is an anthropology major, had no real interest in Montgomery when she started working with us, uh, but had uh, submitted a paper to our conference this June to present on the research she had done with us. So anyway, she did research into the uh, Montgomery sites on PEI. Uh, She figured out the mapping software and she has over 100 sites related to Montgomery's life and works on this map. So that's really exciting to be able to to work with students and grow their interest in Montgomery and Prince Edward Island and um, see them develop new skills. And also, you know, it's a great example of how the Institute is sharing information about Montgomery. That's, you know, I think potentially Actually useful and interesting to a lot of people, whether you're a tourism operator or just visiting the island. Mm. And the your uh, your Montgomery, I, I've already got it wrong. The your Montgomery story. Can you tell us yes. about that? It, it, the interview was pr- pretty recent, and I've already uh, messed up the title. So set me straight and tell us a little bit about that project. Yeah, so this is a project that I'm doing with uh, Trina Fravor, who is a independent scholar and fiction writer in Florida. And she presented, did this great presentation um, at the last conference in 2018. Yeah, it was pre-recorded um, conference presentation and she wasn't even in the room and she had audience participation. It was amazing. And she introduced this idea of how Montgomery scholars and readers and fans are often sharing their Montgomery origin story of how they first encountered Montgomery's works. And a lot of people were really excited after this presentation. And I reached out to her and said, I really think that we should be collecting um, these stories. And so that's how it all started. So we have a survey, which you can um, find at your lmmontgomerystory.com or your lmmstory.com and goes to the same place. So people can share their experience of first discovering Montgomery's uh, world, whether that's uh, the Sullivan films and with an E, vlogs, the books themselves. And then we're also interested in other ways that Montgomery's world has impacted people's lives. Wow. 
That's great. I mean, and there's actually, if you go to the LM Montgomery Institute's website, there's just reams of things and mm -hmm. extra resources. And so I would encourage listeners to do that. One of the things the LMMI does is encourage new and emerging scholars. Mm -hmm. And are there any areas where you would like to see either new explorations of Montgomery's life and works or the way she's read or press in on an area where there's been a bit of a gap in the past? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I have a long list, I think, of potential uh, conference topics. Like, I'd mm. love to see something on Montgomery and material culture. The uh, University of York has an 18th century uh, center for 18th century studies, and they just did a conference on small things, which I think would be a lot of fun, like zeroing in on the on the ephemeral. And um, I think it's an interesting way of bringing the past alive and looking at it in new ways. Um, I think something on Montgomery and fun, you know, she's there's a lot of just pleasure and recreation would be really great as well. Um, and, and of course, and technology. So Montgomery was very interested in the technologies that were emerging in her period. So photography, for example, but now there's all this digital humanities work. So I think there's, you know, there's so much potential there. And, you know, there's, there's so much happening in the Montgomery world outside of academia. So in pop culture, um, at the various Montgomery sites in Ontario and PEI. So there's a lot of, of scope there in terms of, of tourism and collaboration. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, I, I love seeing the new list of conference papers when they come out. Yeah. And it makes me realize, like, you know, how, how many ways we could read the books and reread the books and, yeah. and the films and everything. So it's, I think it's brilliant. So finally, to, to wrap up, like, how do people connect with the Institute? Mm -hmm. What do they do next? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we'll certainly come to the conference, uh, although we were really disappointed that the in-person conference wouldn't happen this year and the end of June in 2020 because of COVID-19. We are going to be doing a virtual version of the conference on the journal website. So it's a great opportunity for people who can't normally come to Prince Edward Island to participate. Um, there's also the, the journal itself. So read the journal, submit to the journal, even if you don't feel ready for a peer reviewed publication, you know, we welcome photography and other kinds of multimedia. There's lots of potential there. We do read alongs as well. So you can check out the one on Anna Green Gables and Emily of New Moon. So that's basically blog style responses to each chapter. So that's kind of a, an easy way to participate in the world. Um, but like you mentioned already, Brenton, just checking out lmmontgomery.ca and getting a sense of, of what we offer. Um, you know, that's a good start. And people are always welcome to reach out um, to me with ideas. That's great. And of course, uh, we've got all the links in the show notes. Uh, we're also going to have links to Kate's work. And you shared with us some of the papers that are upcoming and some of the past. It's, you've got a great uh, CV when it comes to uh, reading and, and thinking about Montgomery and space. So, so, Kate, thanks so much for sitting down with us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. As always, you can check out the works of the Ellen Montgomery Institute at lmmontgomery.ca including interactive features, guest blogs, news about conferences and calls for papers, the newest releases of the Journal of Ella Montgomery Studies, and links to digital resources, like the beautiful online repository, Kindred Spaces. And if you enjoyed the modcast and would like others to enjoy it as well, please share on social media and give us a rating. It really helps spread the news about modcast and the Institute's work. And it helps get the word out about this cutting edge, global leading research and these new initiatives we're talking about. I'm your host, Brenton Dickerson, and I'm here with technical director, Christy McKinney. Until next time, remember that a room where one dreams and grieves and rejoices and lives becomes inseparably connected with those processes and acquires a personality of its own. Farewell. Farewell.